that baptism originated with John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, but in all actuality and historically, the ritual of baptism was practiced regularly in Judaism. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizo, which can mean a change of condition accomplished through immersion. This ritual immersion occurs in a mikvah, M-I-K-V-A-H. It sounds like mitvah, doesn't it? It's a mikvah, a Hebrew word meaning the gathering, the gathering of the waters. It contains the same root letters as the word hope. Religious Jews entered a mikvah for many common life events as instructed in scripture. And they entered for spiritual purification and preparation for the holy days. The mikvah was symbolic of the womb, the tomb, and rebirth. This inward cleansing created a pure connection with God. A place where hope was reawakened and strengthened. Sometimes we need to have our hope reawakened, don't we? As well as strengthened. Judaism regards the mikvah as a symbolic expression of rebirth. We often hear in Christianity, in the evangelical wor world, about being born again, and we think that this is a Christian phrase. But actually, the phrase born again, again originated in Judaism. Entering into the waters of the mikvah was symbolic of dying to their old life emerging out of the water as a newborn child with a new identity. The mikvah represented the mother's womb, comes from the same root as the Hebrew word for mercy. Immersing into the waters of the mikvah is like re-entering the womb. Do you remember that story that Jesus had in the Gospel of John chapter 3? with Nicodemus, how can I be born again? It comes, the word mikvah and this understanding comes from Judaism. Immersing into the waters of the mikvah is like re-entering the womb, the place of mercy of God's creative power. Jewish rabbi Rachel Berenblatt has a blog called The Velveteen Rabbi. What a great name. <laughs> she writes, God's mercy flows forth from the divine womb. God is the one in whom, in whose womb all creation is nurtured. On a microcosmic level, we were cushioned in the waters of the uterus in the womb. On a macrocosmic level, we can return to those waters in a cosmic sense and emerge reborn into renewed spiritual life, ready to draw down the cosmic abundance with which God nurtures all creation. For Christians, baptism has marked entry into the Christian church, which is why medieval churches and Catholic churches often have the baptismal font at the back of the church, near the door, near the threshold, symbolizing entry. As one of two sacraments in the Protestant church, baptism represents an outward and invisible sign of God's inward and visible grace already at work within us. When God called Jesus, my son, when Jesus came to be baptized by John, it speaks of the unique relationship that Jesus has with God. And 
in scripture, we see that scripture also affirms that we are all drawn into intimate relationship with God. So the same could be said of each of us when we were born or baptized or recognized God's presence in our life. You are my beloved child upon whom my favor rests, in whom I am well pleased. For me, baptism is a reminder of being beloved of God. We may not see the opening of the heavens or hear God's voice telling us that we are beloved. We may not see the spirit descending upon us like a dove. And yet one of my few but firmly held beliefs is this. I believe God continues to bless us and to speak this affirmation of grace to us. You are my beloved child upon whom my favor rests. And there are forces at work which make it difficult for us to hear and truly receive the blessings God has for us and to receive the name beloved of God. At some point, we start receiving perhaps other messages. I don't know how old you were when you started receiving other messages other than love in your life, but we start receiving other messages that put a chink into that core, that sense, that tender sense of feeling beloved by God. I have a few stories. You've heard them before. They bear repeating. They're part of my childhood. You have a different childhood. The youngest of six, five older brothers. And these songs will date me. Uh, those of you who remember these songs might remember the era, but they used to sing, go away, little girl. And then there was that song, short people got You know this one, AJ. <laughs> Short people got no reason to live. They, they got little eyes, little legs. You got to pick them up just to say hi. Short people got no reason to live. And then there was the ugly stick story. Some of you might remember my ugly stick story. My brother, 10 years older than me. I don't remember how old I was when he told me this story. Six, seven, eight, I don't know, 15. Oh, Kath, looks like you got hit by an ugly stick. Oh, did I make you cry? Did I hurt your feelings? I'm sorry. That's not what I meant to say. What I really meant to say, wait for it. It was the whole tree. Did this? Growing up with my brothers, did they really put chinks in my sense of belovedness? I'm not really sure. You have other stories. And it's good to remember those stories, not to dwell too long on them, but simply to realize that our stories of receiving messages other than belovedness, they, they begin to take away who God has created at the core of our being as beloved. It puts chinks in our sense of feeling beloved. We start comparing ourselves to others and internalize the motto, you aren't smart enough, you're not successful enough, good looking enough, thin enough, this enough, that enough, to the point where we are challenged to believe that we are God's beloved. And yet within each of us resides a deep longing for love and belonging. The mystery about God is that we are all God's beloved, although I have that mouse pad that says, this is love. 
it wasn't in my script and I couldn't remember, but you all remembered. <laughs> Jesus loves you, but I'm, I'm his favorite. <laughs> but in the mystery of God's grace, we're all God's favorite. Before we have done anything to deserve it or earn it. So the story of Jesus, he had not yet entered public ministry as far as we are aware from scripture. When he was baptized by John, when he emerges from the waters, Jesus hears the voice from heaven. You are my beloved upon you. My favor rests in you. I am well pleased. The timing is interesting. It comes before any miracles or healings. God might have waited until after Jesus had turned water into wine to say, oh, I'm so proud. Or God might have waited until Jesus had healed the blind man and then said, that's my son. I am so pleased with him. Or God might have waited until the feeding of the multitudes or walking on water or other miracles and then exclaimed, wow, you're amazing. I created a good thing. But that is not the progression. Jesus was immersed in God's favor before doing anything. A confirmation that he was deeply loved by God, a blessing at the beginning of his ministry, simply for being. I am not a parent, but the parents I know didn't start to love their children only after they made good decisions or achieved something great. They hope their love and guidance help, helps their child make good decisions as they grow, but their love is not contingent on good decisions made. For the parents out there, is that true for you? I'm not convinced. Is it true? Parents, well, I shall say most parents I know, love their children simply because, I mean, dot, 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 because this, because that, or simply because this is their child and they love their child. I've heard people say, I think I've heard Nancy Tam Davis say these words. Maybe you've said them too. God loves you. I love you with a tag. And there isn't anything you can do about it. But even if we've heard the words before, those of you who have been part of this congregation for a few years, you hear these at least once a year, these words. But even if you've heard the words before, we sometimes still struggle to internalize God's love for us. There is also the question of our mental health. Millions of people suffer from seasonal or ongoing anxiety and depression, or depression. If you do not suffer from any mental health issues, chances are you are close to someone who does. So much continues to threaten our well being in these times of anxiety and uncertain, feeling afraid down or depressed or uncertain is not a sin. It doesn't mean that you are separated from God. But we often have doubts or we are afraid about whether to admit it. To admit that we are struggling. to God, to others, to ourselves.
Like the lack of sunshine and shortened days that can trigger seasonal affective disorder, especially in the Pacific Northwest during the winter. The lack of light in the dim corners of our psyche and our soul can bring on spiritual affective disorder. This is, is a term that Marcia McPhee has coined and who has created this worship series from Worship Design Studio. And she says that it can make us feel a bit of the blahs, which can manifest as sadness, irritability, criticizing others, fatigue, burnout, or grief. Many are struggling with anxiety or depression with good reason. As we begin our worship series on spiritual affective disorder, we will begin to look at the spiritual practices which may be able to help us shake off the bleak midwinter blues when frosty wind made moan. While not a replacement for medical resources or therapists, to alleviate complex mental health issues, we can find ways to be renewed and recharged spiritually in this liturgical season of Epiphany, where we can get some light into our lives, some spiritual light. What if everyday activities could become healing spiritual practices to receive God's blessing in our lives, to deepen our experience of a meaningful life, to boost our mood a bit, to help shine a light on the blahs. The prophet Isaiah was speaking to people in the midst of despair and hopelessness during a difficult season in their life. The history of the Israelites included a siege of Jerusalem by the Assyrians, the Babylonian exile, and the return from exile, kind of like we are still returning from the pandemic. Isaiah 60 offers words of hope with reassurances of light, abundance, new life, prosperity. Arise, shine, for your light has broken through. The eternal one's brilliance has dawned upon you. Look carefully, darkness blankets the earth. People all over are cloaked in darkness, but God will rise and shine on you. Oh my gosh, I'm being taken back to Sunday school. Are you with me? God will rise and shine on you. The eternal's bright glory will shine on you. A light for all to see. That is the translation from the voice. Paul read from the New Revised Standard Version. The translation from the message is a bit more direct. Some people have difficulty sleeping at night. Do you know someone who has difficulty sleeping at night or find it difficult to get out of bed in the morning? Do you know someone who has a difficult time getting out of bed in the morning? You might point somewhere else and some of you might be pointing to yourself. Sometimes our emotional state is in such a difficult place or maybe our medical health state is in a difficult place, that even the act of arising from sleep each morning is difficult because of burnout, grief, depression, our health. These words that I'm going to be reading to you from the message translation are not meant to be harsh, but they are an invitation to new life, rebirth. Get out of bed, Jerusalem. Wake up, put your face in the sunlight. God's bright glory has risen for you. 
The whole earth is wrapped in darkness. All people are sunk in deep darkness, but God, God rises in you. God's sunrise glory breaks over you. Whoever wrote these words did not live during a PNW winter, I can assure you of that. But the sun rises regardless of whether we can see it or not. And that is the hope and the miracle. It may feel mundane, but the very act of rising arising can be a spiritual practice affirming that each day is a gift from god i think some of you have told me that when you wake up in the morning you say to god i'm still here thanks be to god this doesn't mean that we are supposed to feel good all the time but it means that each day is a new chance a new opportunity to offer our gratitude to god while it may seem difficult to wake up early enough to watch the sunrise, there is somebody in my household who does that every morning, taking a walk in the dark and greeting the sunrise. Sometimes just the act of getting out of bed is all that is required to bring our awareness to God's presence in our lives each day. And people say, scientists, therapists, they, like they say, they say that exposing yourself to early morning light can help develop a healthy circadian rhythm, allowing you to get more restful sleep at night. And so if you want to try this practice on during the season of epiphany, research has also shown that watching the sunrise may help to boost your mood, to reduce inflammation and depression, and even help you get a better sleep at night. God's glory dawns over us day after day, sunrise after sunrise. Watching the sunrise can also attribute, contribute to a feeling of awe and wonder, which research tells us has an anti-inflammatory effect on the body. This spiritual practice of arising each day brings us an awareness of God's abundance in our lives. It's a way we can be grateful, even when depression can make that feeling of gratitude hard to recognize or even feel. And so I invite you into a spiritual practice of arising every morning with these words. Arising to the light outside with the sunrise is acknowledging God. Arising to the light within is acknowledging our belovedness in God. It has a Celtic ring to it and we can riff off of saint patrick's prayer that goes like this christ with me christ before me christ behind me christ in me christ ben beneath me christ above me and it goes on and on but what if we took on a spiritual practice arising to the light with me the light before me the light behind me the light in me the light around me the light above me And so it's an invitation to the spiritual practice of arising to our belovedness in God and to the light. I want to close with this poetry by Stephen Garnes Holmes. Awaking this morning, you rise out of the waters of creation. Heaven has spilled out into this world. Live this day as if you are in heaven. You are God's beloved. Radiant with the image of God, you belong. 
You are immersed in Christ who heals you, who accompanies you, who dies and rises in you. You brim with spirit humming within. Let her live in you. Let her sing. Let her fly. Let her love in her infinite way. You can give for you have abundantly received. Christ will go about the world now, healing and teaching, blessing and serving in your hands and ears and eyes. The fire with which God will change the world glows within you. Tend it. Amen. Thanks be to God. Eyes and body or spirit to sing, come my way, my truth, my life, my breath, my light. It's found in the red hymnal 164.